This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Matteo Communications. Hello, my fellow people of the plant. Let's talk for a moment about brand awareness in the cannabis space. The industry is obviously becoming more crowded as it matures. So how do you effectively break through the noise? We all know cannabis marketing has restrictions that make our jobs more difficult. But fortunately, the kick-ass PR and marketing professionals at Matteo Communications know how to elevate your narrative while staying compliant. Their New York and LA-based teams have the connections and powerful storytelling abilities you need to propel your brand onto the national stage. Matteo refuses to let your bold innovations and ambitious breakthroughs fall through the cracks. They'll get your company in front of your most prized audiences via their specialties, which include PR, social media, investor relations, SEO, and more. Matteo shares your vision of normalizing cannabis for the greater good of society. They proudly partner with businesses across the industry, from investors and ancillary companies to large MSOs and local brands. No matter your business goals, Matteo is here to help. Email them today at info at matteo.com. That's I-N-F-O at symbol M-A-T-T-I-O dot com or visit their website at matteo.com to get your company the recognition it deserves. Hello, my fellow people of the plant. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Cannabinoid Connect podcast, your favorite podcast that includes industry-facing conversations with the industry's leading experts that aim to educate and inform the public regarding the plant's endless benefits. My guest today is Jeremy Burke. He's a senior reporter at Insider. Jeremy Burke, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, Kevin. It's great to uh, great to be here. It's great. It's great to have you. We we made it happen. Um, I know how busy you are. I guess from the offset, just because I see all the great reporting that you do for Insider within the cannabis industry and how active you are on Twitter, man. So I'm just glad that we can pick your brain today and really get a sense of what the landscape is out there. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna say active on Twitter for better or for worse, for sure. <laughs> but. Uh, you know, let us define each other. So there's always, uh, you know, good ramifications from it. That's right. Hey, no, you can't please everybody, especially on Twitter. So, um, hey, you just got to go with your gut and you're doing you're doing the right things and, and covering really, really interesting and informative stories. So before we dive into to that, Jeremy, let's first talk about your background. Um, have you have you always been a consumer of cannabis or an advocate and kind of what got you on the path to solely focus on reporting for insider within the cannabis industry? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, to answer to answer the first part of your question. Um, yes, I've been a cannabis <laughs> consumer for a long time. Nice. Um, it's now legal in New York where my home is. So I can finally finally say that publicly um, before I kind of kept that close to the chest. Um Hi. But no, so I, you know, I, I have been interested in cannabis legalization for, for a really, really long time. Um, you know, I, I never designed for it to be a professional focus. I, in fact, didn't know it could be. Um, but even, you know, when I, was, I grew up in Toronto, Canada, um, in grade 10, I did a, uh, or, or 10th grade, as Americans say, I did a, um, a product for my social studies class uh, about Canada's push to legalize marijuana. No, so I have, <laughs> I have that, you know, 15 year old, like, you know, it, it's sort of like a faux academic paper, but it was, you know, little did I know that that would sort of animate my life, you know, almost, almost 15 years later. What, what was um, the response from your teacher when you, when you brought that in, were, were they, was she open to it? Was she, oh, they, no, kinda... they, they loved it. I, they loved it. Was, it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I went to a, I went to a private school that was pretty, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? I mean, it's, it's pretty buttoned down place. Like we had to wear a uniform, our hair couldn't be long, like get the shave every day, you know, pretty buttoned right. down yeah. place. But the teachers like loved, loved that. I think some of them were sort of old hippies and, and thought <laughs> it was funny that, you know, I was so focused on this issue, um, but we turned around a really good project. I mean, it was, it was cool. We got to go out in the field and, you know, talk to stakeholders, talk to people working on these issues. Um, back then in Toronto in, in Queens Park, which is a big park, there was these yearly, um, you know, 420 and, and, and cannabis parade marches, they'd call them. So we got to go to those and talk to people. And it was just this fun, exciting thing to do. Um, That's awesome. And frankly, yeah. learned a lot about, uh, you know, some of the reasons why cannabis had been illegal in Canada, the US in the first place. Um, and that was really eye opening, you know, not to take uh, conventional wisdom for granted, um, to look at some of the historical reasons uh, why cannabis was ever illegal and how it, it demonized, uh, you know, populations like, you know, I myself, I'm a straight white man, but it demonized a lot of people um, who I feel did not, <laughs> A, deserve that and B, you know, uh, were, were sort of at the, uh, 
you know, we're, we're, we're sort of criminalized at the expense of the system. And, and that was that was an eye opening thing for me to look through. It wasn't just I want to get high. It was like, wow, this whole layer and decades long pattern of criminality. Um, you know, so that was it was definitely an interesting, interesting, interesting way in. Um, right. And that was kind yeah. of the key takeaway from that project, right, was really the social injustice um, and social equity component of people that have been disenfranchised from the plant. Yeah, that and I, I would say, you know, the, the second part was also, um, you know, just how difficult it is to actually legalize it. Like, it, it, it's easy to do when you say, if you're a politician, you say, okay, let's legalize cannabis and reap it all the revenue. But it's like, okay, like, there's a lot of opinions about how to do this. There's a lot of stakeholders, and you have to get everyone's interest aligned. And then as soon as you start getting into the technical details, uh, it, it gets very, very complicated. Like, what federal agency is in control of regulating these products? Uh, how do you award licenses? Like, what does the law actually look like? Where does the tax revenue go? So all these kind of questions touch on all these sort of interesting topics that might not be related to cannabis or even using cannabis, but um, open these really, I think, tricky, thorny, and interesting public policy questions as well. Is that, and so kind of switching gears now and kind of talking about the current state of talks of reform and legalization. Yeah. And, and coming to this point, would you say that, you know, maybe part of the reason why it's taken this long has because, of course, due to the, the prohibition through, um, you know, bad reasons, right, targeting people um, of color, like we talked about earlier, but also the fact that it is so complex and that there's so many layers to that, that they've kind of maybe pushed it off for a while and put it on the states to decide? Yeah, you know. I, I don't, so I, I'm saying this anecdotally, like I, you know, I, I'm not talking to these lawmakers every sure. single day. I'm not sure. in DC. So um, this is sort of my opinion. And, yeah. And, and we're going to, we'll preface that for the entire conversation is that these are all anecdotal. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, but to answer your question, uh, absolutely. It is the case, uh, you know, public support in the U S for legalizing cannabis is extremely high. Um, I think the recent Pew polling was like less than 10% of adults want cannabis to be illegal. Um, but just because support is really high doesn't mean that lawmakers are actually going to do it. And to actually do it, to your point, is it's very difficult. There's a lot of things to iron out. These are tricky issues, um, especially in light of the Black Lives Matter protests last year. Um, there's a lot of careful language they have to use to kind of advocate and advance for their position in the public sphere. Um, that being said, you know, we've seen some interesting moves like, you know, cannabis legalization is a social equity issue. It's a racial justice issue. Uh, but we have seen Republicans come at it from the other angle, from the personal freedom issue, the state's rights issue, sort of, uh, you know, fomenting or, or helping encourage business development. Um, so there are two sides to that coin. Um, and, you know, Rep. Joyce introduced a bill last week, uh, which honestly took me by surprise. Um, you know, Senator Chuck Schumer says he has a bill coming. So the gears are rolling and the ball is rolling. And it seems to be rolling in a somewhat bipartisan way. Um, but, you know, if I had a crystal ball and I could predict when the lawmakers would actually legislate that, I'd probably be, uh, you know, a wealthier man than I am right now, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. No one, no one can predict when it's actually going to happen. And it's, but it's, it, the good thing is it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when, right. We're all kind of in that consensus. It's just like, when will this actually happen? So let's dive into that specific bill that yeah. you mentioned, uh, from representative Joyce. And I believe what you're talking about is the common sense cannabis reform for veterans, small businesses yep. and medical professionals act. Yep. So what's interesting about that bill from what I've read to your point is that they've really left out the social equity, social justice component, but they focus on, um, you know, like you said, uh, ending prohibition by descheduling, leaving it up to the States. Mm -hmm. um, and, and adding more research, right, to, to understand the efficacy of the plant from a medicinal standpoint. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and I, I will add to that, that, uh, you know, uh, Representative Don Young, um, he, he was also co-sponsored the bill, and he's sort of been uh, very much engaged on cannabis legalization issues for a long time, so it's not coming out of the blue, I think I should have, I should have sort of rephrased that, um, but it is, it is interesting in that this bill was introduced, while Senator Schumer has sort of been out there in the press and the media, you know, rattling the drum to say like, oh, my bill is coming any day now, any day now, and it hasn't come yet. So there is a little interesting backroom politicking going on there. I can only guess my as to why. Um, right. But my no, to answer, yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah. I was going to say, just if I'm for speculating on it, you know, what yeah. I would think is, um, it, in my opinion, it is a bipartisan issue, but it's politicized. 
because totally. yeah. the, the Democrats don't want the Republicans to have a win and the Republicans don't want to have the Democrats to have a win. So it's, it's vice versa. It goes back and forth. I think the play here at the House level for the for these Republicans to introduce this this uh, common sense can of cannabis reform bill in the House is maybe, in my opinion, seeing that the Biden administration really hasn't voiced what their stance is on yeah. cannabis reform or legalization. So maybe it's a way to put pressure on the Democrats by saying, look, us Republicans will, will try to move this thing forward. We know that Schumer's all about it, right? Because he's tweeting about it every other day. I'm right. just confused as to, you know, it's the terminology has gone from soon to, uh, what was it? Um, soon to shortly or something like that. So he, he's interchanging the words. I'm looking forward to what that will look like. Do you think yeah. that he's, he's going to focus just on safe banking or is it going to be more kind of a holistic approach to the reform? No. So I, I think, I mean, in, in contrast to uh, the bill that Republicans introduced, you know, I think, I think Schumer's bill is going to be very comprehensive. I think he's been, and, and, you know, this is, this is reflected by, by lobbyists to speak with and, and some of the companies that are, that are lobbying on this issue. But, you know, I think Schumer is concerned that, you know, safe banking, um, you know, which for maybe for viewers that don't understand, it's sort of a narrow bill that would, allow cannabis companies to access the federal banking system like any other industry. Um, you know, I, I think Senator, Senator Schumer's position, excuse me, is that, you know, he could get that passed, but it might undercut the position for more comprehensive reform, particularly on racial uh, and equity issues that, that he has been, you know, so upfront about wanting to include in this legislation. So yes, he could go and get Safe Banking Act done in the Senate. There probably is the votes for that. Um, but I don't think he wants to kind of undercut his position. I think to your earlier point that passing cannabis reform is complicated, it's political, it's tricky. I think if the Senate passes safe banking, that would just keep kicking the can down the road and we'd be left in this sort of state federal conflict environment uh, for many years, um, you know, particularly if polling shows that, uh, you know, the Republicans have a really good shot about taking it back the House, um, that will be where, you know, <laughs> Uh, any sort of more comprehensive legislation goes to die that is that is focused on, uh, uh, I want to be careful and say that's focused on racial and social equity issues because it becomes a talking point for Republicans to say, like, why are we expanding the government? You know, why are we raising taxes on this? Um, why are we attacking this in the first place? That, isn't this anti-small business? Um, so, you know, they will attack it from that standpoint. So I think Schumer really has a good shot to do this now. Um, and I think he wants to get it done in a comprehensive way. And for all intents and purposes, despite the fact that, you know, we haven't seen the bill yet, it seems like this is um, this is something that his team and his staffers and the staffers of Senator Cory Booker and Senator Ron Wyden are working on very hard and very closely. Like this isn't something they're putting out as a negotiating position. Um, they're writing this legislation in a way that they hope will turn into law. Um, and then just the last thing I'll say on that is, well, yes, you know, the Biden administration has been no friend, I would say, to the cannabis industry. You know, there was the recent reporting that they, you know, let people in the White House go that had admitted to cannabis use, um, which is obviously not the stance a friendly president would take. Um, that being said, you know, if the Democrats, his party controls both houses of Congress and they deliver him a bill, uh, I think the chances of that bill getting signed are very, very, very high. I don't want to say 100%, but I think if that cannabis bill lands on his desk, you know, Biden will sign that and he will go into the 2024 cycle touting that as a win. Yeah, that that's the million dollar question that everybody's wondering, right? So to back up, I completely agree with you in that, you know, it's it's clear that Schumer and, and Brooker, they're, they're very passionate about this, right? This yeah. is something that they're very close to. And I like the more comprehensive approach. Um, in addition to what you said on the social equity and, in, and social injustice component is, just passing safe banking, I'm sure that these large institutions would still be hesitant to do any type of business transactions with com with cannabis companies when it's still federally listed as a Schedule One narcotic. So right. to your right. point of like kicking it down, <laughs> kicking the can down the road, like I totally get where Schumer's position is. Like, why are we gonna pass this when it gives these these large private banking banking institutions no incentive to do so? Right. Like, right. So, and, and yeah. you know, not only that, it's it's the exchanges, right? Like it's the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ. I'm sure they want the business of cannabis companies, you know, MSOs in the U.S., Curly, Green Thumb Industries, you know, truly, they want the business of those companies being able to list on these exchanges. And for those companies, 
you know, having access to, in, to real institutional investors, you know, a more liquid exchange would be great. Um, but it remains to be seen, you know, whether whoever works on compliance or the legal departments of those exchanges would say the Safe Banking Act is enough, right? Um, it's totally open to interpretation. You know, it, it sort of kicks the question to, you know, state prosecutors who might wake up on the wrong side of the bed and say like, you know, I'm gonna go after the cannabis industry today. Um, right. So it, it just sort of, it, it continues this nebulous weird framework that makes operating the industry very, very hard and also makes advancing policy goals very, very hard. That being said, you know, it is my opinion that safe banking, um, you know, my opinion based on reporting that safe banking probably does have enough votes to pass the Senate with or without the filibuster, um, but that more comprehensive reform probably does not right now. Um, mm -hmm. And it remains to be seen um, whether they can even get to 50 Democrats, let alone the 10 Republicans they need uh, for Schumer's bill. But again, you know, very willing to be wrong on that. And I'm very willing to be corrected on that. But that's just sort of where, uh, you know, our reporting has led in, in uh, recent weeks. Sure. You know, one thing that I'm, I'm interested to see what plays out is, you know, because you have this, you have, of course, the House, you have the, the, the blue wave, right? Of course, the Democrats yeah. control every, you know, the House, the Senate, and of course, the, the presidential administration. And so within that, I wonder how this all plays out once Schumer introduces the bill, when it comes to, um, you know, the progressive Democrats, you know, versus the more moderate Democrats and getting this thing through. And I bring up that example yeah. because New Mexico is a perfect use case of how this kind of played out. New Mexico is um, the state in which I was born and raised. And so I've kind of kept a close eye on uh, cannabis legalization, which was recently passed. Yep. And, and basically what they had to do was, you know, they wanted to come out really strong with a, a really heavy uh, social equity component to their cannabis HB 12 bill. But ultimately, what they had to do was completely remove that component and leave it as a standalone bill. So mm -hmm. while they focused, you know, immensely on that social equity component, they knew that to get it through and to get it on the governor's desk to be signed, they had to remove that. And so I wonder how that social equity component will play out because we both agree it's super important, needs to be done. The people yeah. that have you know been wrongfully um, you know treated for mistreated for this plant um, due to prohibition, they their records need to be expunged. They need to be released from jail. But I just don't know if it will happen you know comprehensively or if they'll need to separate it like other states have done. I mean, yeah. Um Kevin, you raise a really, really good point there, right? I mean, New Mexico, again, is not New York, right? New right. York is run by Democrats. It's, it's you know, for all intents and purposes, upstate New York maybe is a little different, but New York City is a very progressive city, right? So uh, New Mexico is a blue state. Um, they have been for a while, though, also, just to throw. Yeah, 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 yeah. My, my only point was that, like, yes, it's a blue state, but it's but the, the level of progressivism in a place True. like New Mexico is different True. than in, in Los Angeles and New York City. Right. Um, that, that was my only point there. And so I think that um, when you are trying to pass this legislation in states, I guess, like given that New Mexico is blue, but maybe a little bit more purple than New York is, um, <laughs> I think that these... Uh, the question of social equity becomes a little bit thornier, a little bit harder to include in the first place because the argument for personal freedom, for economic opportunity is so clear cut and increasingly clear cut to both sides of the aisle at this point. Um, stigma remains, you know, there are social conservatives who just, you know, for whatever reason uh, will not and never will like cannabis, um, but even staunch conservatives can get behind uh, economic opportunity, they can get behind states' rights, and they can get behind personal freedom. So I think that allows the, you know, it, it creates a narrowing of the negotiation for getting these bills passed. I mean, you can even look at states like Arizona um, compared to California, right? I mean, they're close. Arizona is again, increasingly Democrat, um, but it's not, uh, I wouldn't put it firmly in the blue column that <laughs> quite yet. Uh, but, but, you know, the way they pass the bill is, is, you know, they have to be a little bit more careful about pushing these sort of progressive talking points than they do in a state like New York does or in a state like New Jersey does, just because these are different states and people have different desires and getting coming to the negotiating table is a little bit more difficult um, in those respects. That makes so much sense. I mean, it's like, know your audience, right? And kind of, yeah. it's like, uh, ease into the blow or, or however you want to position the messaging, but you, you got to know your audience and then speak to that audience in the in the most effective way. I totally I get what you're saying right. there. 
when you talk about when we go back to the 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 concept of how complex cannabis legalization is you know whether it be the state level or the, or the federal level um you know one thing that i read on in within i think joyce joyce's bill is that they're proposing that the fda and the attb the alcohol tobacco and tax yep. uh bureau would oversee regulation of this so is that do you envision like the same government bodies regulating within Schumer's bill as well? Or would that, would that be different? That is a very good question. Um, and I think the agencies are going to continue to fight over this where their jurisdiction starts and where the other jurisdiction ends. Um, I do think the FDA will absolutely play a large role in however this shakes out. Um, because again, you know, these are going to be supplements. These are going to be food products, edibles. Um, these are going to be consumable things that the FDA will regulate. Um, I do think that, you know, the DEA will probably have, I, I don't know about a fight is the right word, but the DEA will probably want to regulate things themselves as well. I mean, they've recently started to allow research licenses. Um, there was reporting last week around that. Um, but whether cannabis gets descheduled is not up to the FDA. It's sort of up to the DEA. Um, the president can do it by decree. Um, he's obviously, as we've spoken about before, he's unlikely to do that. So there, yes, there's going to be a little bit of a jurisdictional battle over who regulates this. Um, but I imagine, you know, again, and this is this is uh, my opinion, I imagine that the FDA will end up being kind of a key agency, uh, or at least key federal agency in charge of this. Um, you know, whether like, will there be a sort of interagency, you know, federal cannabis bureau? Um, you know, I don't know. Um, that's a possibility as well. I mean, some states have started that, you know, New York is creating its own cannabis control board. Uh, California has its own cannabis control board. So we'll see how that shakes out. Um, but, but like anything in federal politics, I mean, it's going to be really challenging, I think, for a lot of lawyers and technocrats to figure out whose jurisdiction this really is and who gets to decide the rules and who gets to change the rules. Right, right. You know, I want to go back to an interesting point that you brought up in the beginning, and it just makes me chuckle a little bit in that I think you said polling right now, 91% of Americans yeah. say either medical or recreational uh, cannabis should be legal. Jeremy, is there any other like issue in the United States right now that Americans are, are support like that? Like, I mean, we're so divided right now, right? It seems yeah. like this is the one thing that we're united on. I mean, it, it's pretty incredible. So, okay. So there is, there is one sticking point here, right? Um, the one thing I want to bring up is that while you know, less than 10% of Americans want cannabis to remain illegal, um, whether that's medical or recreational, you know, it's still not a majority of Republicans who want recreational or adult use cannabis to be legal. I think the number, I'm going off the top of my head now, but I think the number is around 47, 48%, I believe. So we're getting very, very close. But again, 47% is not a majority. So it's not quite at the tipping point where I think it's inevitable but, you know, the snowball is rolling downhill. It's picking up a lot of momentum and it's getting larger and larger and, uh, you know, completely unavoidable, I would say. Um, but, you know, when you look at the data a little bit closer, I mean, among young Republicans, I think, you know, in the 18 to 29 year old bracket, uh, yes, there's a majority of support. So it's like these are sort of inevitable things. Um, and I know this is sort of a tired analogy, but, uh, you know, the one issue where we've seen such a rapid social change, the one public policy question we see on that is same-sex marriage, right? Um, there's a point in time when, you know, uh, there was a very large majority of Americans who didn't want same-sex marriage, and that was, you know, as recently as the 90s, and now it's like, you know, that, that's unthinkable in 2021. It's like, you know, what the hell? So um, it's an yeah. interesting question, um, but, you know, I, I do want to be careful about this inevitability question, because while there's really, really strong support, uh, you know, it still does lack in some areas, and it still means that people that want to get this done still need to be out there uh, trying to get it done. If you are an activist or, you know, work in the industry, you know, there still is a lot of work to do to make sure that this happens. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a generational thing, really, right? Like when you talk about the example of same-sex marriage, I mean, I remember those times. I was I was born in the late 80s. So growing up, like there was homophobia. There was a sense of, I don't want that. You know, I don't, I don't want that to be part of society. But right. to the point, like now, like you said, it's not even like people within our age group, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I don't know of anyone my <laughs> right. age that's like, no, same-sex marriage. I don't want them to be happy together. Like that's, right. that's kind of crazy to me. So I think that like to your point, 
we'll start to see that people because because the only opposition that I hear right now from staunch conservatives is very, very ignorant um, statements or claims, right? Like, you know, you had Governor Ricketts talking about if you legalize your kids will die. Like there's no <laughs> factual evidence to support any of this stuff. And what they're doing is they're pulling out of the, the playbook of the reefer madness days. And yeah. people are too savvy today. We're, we're too smart as a generation and to, to be fooled by that. So um, I think the inevitability comes when that generation starts to fade and those convers you know, those um, opposing views aren't as vocalized, you know? Yeah, I think, I think that's a really, really smart point. I mean, I, I, you know, to your point about, about the opposition, um, a lot of it is, you know, I'm saying this as a reporter, um, a lot of it is, you know, it's hard to call it anything other than propaganda. Like it's, right. it's, 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 it's not factual. It relies on tropes of like, you know, crime and, and, you know, things that are just, that we now know are just completely racist. Uh, crime, it'll kill your kids. Like everyone's going to die on the highway. because <laughs> you're going to be driving high. Like productivity is going to go down. Um, you know, we now have the benefit of, of almost a decade of legalization in the U.S. Uh, you know, the sky has absolutely not fallen. You know, we've seen teen use in Colorado go down. Uh, you know, the, the uh, epidemic of highway deaths has not occurred. That being said, you know, there are legitimate, you know, I want to I want to caveat that there are legitimate arguments against cannabis legalization. They're few and far between. But yes, there are legitimate arguments and people do have very legitimate concerns about this. And I don't want to belittle that or, but, or what what are those, Jeremy? Let's let's pull them out there because I, I love to sure. be objective. You know what I mean? Let's yeah. talk through some of those concerns. Yeah. So yeah, I think I mean I I, I think the one concern that I see continue to crop up among the more reasonable anti-set is the question of driving, right? It's like, yes, you know, there are now studies showing that driving high is safer than driving drunk, uh, but driving high is not safe. It's not as safe as driving sober. Um, and there is no test, basically. Right. I mean, you can do a, a, a blood test, but that takes, you know, days or, or at least hours to get the results back. There's no clear roadside test they can use to figure out who's driving high and who to remove from the road. Um, so that's one area and that's that's gotten really contentious. I mean, even in Vermont, police unions um, said they would only support legalization if this test was developed and they do have a reasonable concern there. Um, the second thing is is on teen use. I mean, there isn't there there wasn't the uptick that a lot of people feared in Colorado, at least, you know, that's one of the states where we have a large enough sample size to see the effects of these policies. But there is a lot of concern on what cannabis and THC can do for teen brains. Uh, there's a lot more troubling evidence that we know now that research has freed up that it is really, really bad uh, when your brain is developing to be consuming cannabis heavily. Um, and you know, there are a lot of public policy things you can do to make sure that cannabis doesn't get in the hands of teens. In my opinion, one of the key ways is regulation and asking for an ID rather than having it be available in the illicit market, but people have other ideas. So those, those are those are the two critical areas that I think. Um, yeah, I, like I love the way yeah. you put that. That was so beautiful, Jeremy. Because I'm yeah. gonna, I'll expand on that idea. <laughs> so, sure, sure. Yeah. You yeah. know, to your point, it's like um, at least in my experience, growing up as a in high school, it, it it was much easier to locate and seek out cannabis than it was to right. you know ob, you know obtain alcohol, for instance. So I say that because. I'm not saying it's okay for young kids under the age of 21 to consume because their brains are still developing and whatnot, but we can't also act like it's not already there, you know, and, and that it hasn't been there for totally. a long time as well. Right. So yeah. to your point with legalizing, regulating, requiring an ID, just like we do for alcohol, it'll start to, you know, remove the accessibility of getting it so freely within the illicit market. Totally. Um, and there is even evidence showing, I mean, these aren't, you know, I, I'm not quite as up to date on the published studies, but I've seen some preprints basically showing that um, teen use has actually gone down slightly in Colorado. Um, you know, whether that's due to, yes, just needing to be over 21 and having an ID, or is it because like, you know, it's just not that cool anymore. Like it's legal, <laughs> like your mom does it. So, you know, I'm not going to go like, who cares? Right. You know, it, like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how you differentiate like proximate versus <laughs> ultimate causes there. Um, but there is research showing that. Um, and then I think, I think just kind of the last piece here, the last, the last thing that anti-legalization advocates, you know, really harp on is that 
Like, is it okay that we are normalizing the use of another intoxicant in society? Like, you know, I have my personal opinions on that, but I do see that argument, right? It's like, it's like, you know, legalization, you don't legalize cannabis to say, okay, it's normal, everyone go do it, but it does have the intended or unintended effect of saying that this is okay, like adults should be able to use this. Um, you know, again, in Colorado, that hasn't really been shown to be such a bad thing. In fact, there are a lot of positives to it. Um, but that is a question. And if you are a socially conservative person, uh, you know, I could see that being a hard, a hard, no, hard stigma hard to get around. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. You yeah. know, and, and that, that brings up such an interesting point, because when I'm thinking about what you're saying, I immediately my brain goes to one word, and that's education, right? Because due to the, the last, what, 100 years of prohibition, it's almost like as a society, we've forgot forgotten the efficacy of the plant from a medicinal therapeutic standpoint and kind of what the plant can do from a material applications standpoint. Right. And it's almost like we're kind of relearning that right now. So what, I, what I'm saying is, is that first off, I, I, given my experience, I would definitely not categorize cannabis, anything like related to alcohol or even to any drugs that are listed within the schedule one listing, because the effects are so different. And so uh, the reason why I think education is that the more that we can educate socially conservative individuals who may not understand because of the of prohibition and the stigma around the plant, it may kind of open, make them be inclined to be more open to at least hearing about it. Because I mean, from the science that I've gathered and scientists that I've had on, I mean, we have endocannabinoid systems, right? We're, we're right. biologically married to this plant from the from the studies that have been shown. So, I don't know. I think that education is a big, big factor in that. It's a it's a it's a valid concern to your point, but I think education can get them over the line. Yeah, I mean, Kevin, that's a re that's a really smart point you made. Obviously, like I I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think that the question it boils down to, it's like, it's like here, here's the argument in simple terms. It's like, why would Senator Mitch McConnell support hemp, but not support recreational <laughs> marijuana, right? But like, no, 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 but to, to your point, I mean, I, I said it seriously, it's like with hemp, it's like, okay, you know, tobacco industry is hurting, um, you know, here's another cash crop. It has all these uses, um, you know, from hempcrete, which is building blocks to fibers to like, you know, even consumable or, or, you know, using it to synthesize CBD product, pain management, like it has all these myriad uses that we're just sort of discovering. And it's just sort of this scientific revolution of discovery. And even if you're a staunch social conservative, like you can make that argument and someone like Mitch McConnell, who um, is one of the most staunch social conservatives yeah. uh, in US politics today can get on board with that, right? But right. there is still that leap to go from saying, okay, here's an edible that will get you high, or here's a beverage that will get you high, or, you know, we're selling joints now. And I think, I think that gap, to your point, is, is really, really hard to close. And yes, absolutely, education is a piece of that. Um, but at a certain point, there are people that who, uh, you know, will probably never be able to close that gap as long as they live. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I tweeted the other day, I was like, People that don't consume cannabis will never understand people that consume cannabis. <laughs> it's true. It's you true. Know? Yeah, it, it's absolutely true. Um, and it, it, it's because it's so, I mean, to what you're saying before, it's so different than alcohol, right? Like it doesn't, yeah. you know, when you, when you consume cannabis, if you are at least a little bit of a refined consumer, it's like you get to a level that is good for you and that works for you. It's not about getting as high as possible. Um, like alcohol, it's not really even, I mean, I guess, you know, with illicit market edibles that are, unlabeled it is easy but you know like with the legal market like it's a five milligram edible you'd have to eat like a lot of those you know to have a marine dowd cannabis cookie experience like it would be a ridiculous thing that you couldn't really do um the point being is just that um it's very different like you people use it to enhance things it's like an enhanced sobriety more than it is another kind of intoxicant or stimulant uh, in the way alcohol is and it's it's completely different and you know to the point about driving it's like we've even seen that with driving it's like studies do show that high drivers yes they're better than drunk drivers but no they're not as good as sober drivers right um so it's a really interesting characterization right i mean it's an external substance at the end of the day right so right if we're being real you can abuse any type of external substance if you if you abuse it right so well you know, yeah i mean i i could yeah. you know like i i uh I like to eat healthy and I like to eat clean, but I do have a soft spot for McNuggets. Like, you know, I can go, I can go out and get McNuggets like anytime I want, but like there, I have a little bit of self-control where like, I'm not going to go 
eat Big Macs and McNuggets for dinner every single night because that would be healthy. But like, no, I don't think McNuggets should be outlawed just because sometimes I, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to, uh, don't want to cast any doubt on alcohol if I'm out drinking and I want to get McNuggets at the late, at late night, you know, like I'm, I'm happy those are available to me, right. As a consumer. So right. um, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Everything in moderation. Yeah, exactly. I, I want to turn to the, uh, the momentum that we're seeing at the state level. Right. So we talked about New Mexico, of course, Arizona mm-hmm. recently legalized uh, New Jersey, New York was a huge one. Yep. Um, Virginia. I mean, they just keep yeah. rolling out, man. I think I think I even read Alabama just signed for medical yep. medical program. Alabama, right. it's crazy. Yeah. Who who would have thought? I mean, wh- one of the things that just occurs to me on that on the question is South Dakota. I mean, yeah, South Dakota did not even have medical marijuana, and a majority of people on the ballot question voted to legalize both medical and recreational. And you know, to our discussion earlier, like whether to classify New Mexico as a purple or a blue state. It's like South Dakota is a red <laughs> state and it is a very it's red state. Very, very red. Right. Yeah. There is no ambiguity there. And so that's an interesting question. I mean, obviously, you know, I, I haven't been as up to date on this as I probably should be, but there is litigation about that. You know, the governor, uh, Christy Noam, is not supportive of cannabis legalization. So it remains to be seen, you know, whether that will actually be put in place. Um, but, you know, it does, it is a symbolic, right? Like Virginia is symbolic. Like that's the, the nexus of the South and they have legal cannabis and they actually pushed up their timeline. I mean, they're yeah. supposed talk, to have talk it. Talk to me yeah. about that. Yeah. That was interesting. Sorry to cut you off. Tell us about that. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. So, so basically Virginia said, um, I want to say this was about maybe six or so weeks ago, six to eight weeks ago. Um, you know, they initially passed legislation that would have legalized cannabis in 2024. Um, the governor has said, we're going to push that up. Uh, and about in, end of February, maybe early March, they actually passed that and they pushed it up. Um, whether that's the governor trying to hold on to some level of popularity, he's obviously been controversial for his own reasons. I don't know, but they they actively pushed up the timeline um, in a way that I think no one saw, co- or, you know, maybe not no one. I didn't see that coming, to be, pers- to be, to be perfectly honest. Um, and it, it just goes to show, it's like people are kind of sick of waiting around. Yeah. It's like, why is this going to take four years? Just figure out the legislation, figure out how you're going to lock the licenses. Like, let's get stores open. You know, we're coming out of a pandemic that really, really hurt our economy, particularly, you know, Main Street small businesses. So why can't this be available now? Um, and I think that will spur a lot of new states to legalize cannabis. Just clearly that economic question um, is really, really apparent right now. And you know, even states like Illinois, you know, they were able to hold on to government jobs because of cannabis revenue. So other states are looking at that and saying, like, you know, let's get a piece of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is the sense of urgency, especially, you know, coming out of this pandemic. Um, you know, the added tax revenue could be huge for these states. And I, I want to ask you, as you've kind of seen these seen these states play out and you're and you're covering these different um, stories, would you say that there's a lot of knowledge sharing among the states? Like, you know, is there one state that's doing it better than others? Are they talking about how they can collaborate and, and work to get this rolled out quicker? Like, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, the benefit of legalizing in 2021, or I guess next year in 2022, is that, again, you have data from what has worked and what has not worked from states like California, Colorado, Oregon, Washington. I mean, it's been long enough that there are economists, public policy experts, lawyers who are studying this and figuring out what has worked and what has not worked. There's people from all disciplines, like whether it's someone who's trying to, you know, pursue economic development or business development, like they're figuring out what works in the policies. Um, You know, whether it's someone who is focused on social justice, aspect of it. It's like, how do we get equity applicants licenses? How do we help them fund their businesses? How do we help them provide the training and tools they need to actually get a business off the ground and not be subject to, you know, predatory loans or predatory investors? So, you know, they do have this benefit. um, And they are, yes, they are talking to each other. I mean, people, you know, state legislators from various states will go to Illinois and see what's worked. They'll go to Colorado and figure out what what's worked and what hasn't, what they wish they could change about the policy. Um, because once the policy is put in place, it gets a little bit harder to change. So um, there is, you know, there is time to figure out the intricacies of this policy. But to your point earlier, I mean, there is glaring budget deficits that a lot of states have. And so the clock is kind of ticking on this. 
Um, and on the social justice question, I mean, every day there are more people of color who are arrested for something that is legal uh, for over a third of Americans now. Absurd. And so the clock is absolutely ticking there uh, to get those arrests ended and to get uh, you know those uh, encounters out of the hands of the police. Yeah, that should be kind of first priority, I would imagine, yeah. right? I mean, talk about a backward system. Um, if you're still incarcerating people for, totally. with with a bill that you're trying to push through to legalize the plant. So, right. Yeah. But it, it is comforting to know, because I always did wonder that. And uh, it is encouraging to hear that they are talking, they're sending representatives to different states, because why not? Right? I mean, like, like we talked about earlier, it's super complex. But if, if we can't collaborate and learn from from one another at a state level, then I don't know. Yeah, why we wouldn't. <clears throat> Yeah, totally. And uh, yeah, and it just goes, to, it's like, it goes back to that same point. It's like, we have, we have hindsight now, right? We have nine years of legal cannabis in the US. We have three years of it in Canada. Um, we have a much better sense of what works now than we did in 2018 or even, you know, 2017, 2016. Um, so just those few years of having the market up and running gives you a lot of data and a lot of insight into how to write these policies in a way uh, that is effective for, you know, whatever, whatever goals you're trying to achieve with it, whether that's economic development or social justice or business development. Right. Well, switching gears off of policy reform legislation or legalization. Um, let's talk about trends that you're, that you're seeing within the industry. From my understanding, Jeremy, you've been covering cannabis, um, solely for since what, 2017. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, going on <laughs> seems like ancient history, but going on four <laughs> years now, it's been uh, it's been my only job, and so yeah, a lot of lot of changes I've seen in four short years. Four years, that's like a that's like a decade, two decades in the cannabis industry, man. It's like dog years, right? <laughs> like yeah, I feel like I've aged decades too. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, you still you still uh, you got your youth look, so you're still good, man. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. no gray that's hairs right. yet. You know, <laughs> just just shaved for you. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, so when we talk about about like trends, right? How, how have you seen the industry really evolve when it comes to methods of consumption, uh, innovative technologies, um, when it comes to devices for consumption? Like, have you seen yeah. a big shift or um, not so much? And, or maybe are we expected to see that shift, you know, in the coming years? If, if you had asked me that question in 2017, my answer would be vapes are gonna take over everything. Right, I would have said that it's such an easy, discreet way to consume. It's really easy to figure out your dose. Uh, you, it's easy to hold. It doesn't smell. You know, you can do it inside, outside, wherever. Right. Um, the scourge or outbreak of vape-related illnesses in 2019, I think, really, really put a damper on the vape market. Um, there are still vapes that exist, but I think if you had talked to me and if you talked to analysts and people that run cannabis companies, they would have all, you know, been betting really, really big on vapes. And I think. That is no longer, um, you know, I do think that there are other exciting consumption types, form factors, whatever you want to call them. Um, I think beverages, you know, are, are slow to roll out. They're a little bit expensive now, but the costs will come down and people will start to like beverages. Um, edibles are a very, very good entry point for a lot of new consumers. Um, but for a lot of experienced consumers, frankly, you know, a five milligram edible doesn't really do it. It's not a very cost effective product to buy, you know, if you, if you have a little bit of a tolerance and that's just, that's sort of the reality. Um, you know, what has surprised me the most is the resilience, I think, of flour, like, <laughs> as we know, is weed, like, right. it still is everyone, there's a lot of ink spilled over, like, this is going to be the new way everyone consumes weed. Um, everyone's going to be eating these edibles or vaping these vapes or drinking these drinks. Uh, but there is a reason that, you know, people have rolled in smoke joints for, you know, hundreds, decades, if not hundreds of years. <laughs> It works. It's great. Um, and so, you know, while I do think beverages will probably take up a little bit more market share, I do think, you know, edibles will start to take up a bit more market share, specifically as brands, you know, get more developed, more well known if they're able to cross state lines. Um, but I think people really do like buying regular plain old weed. And I think that finally we're seeing, you know, the bigger MSOs just lean into that. Like, how do we make good pot that people want? Like, we don't have to get super fancy. You know, we don't have to patent all these crazy processes for extracting the cannabis while that is valuable. And I do think, you know, those will end up being good acquisition targets whoever owns those patents. Um, it doesn't mean that like growing good weed is still the most important thing to do right now. That will change, like I said, um, but it remains remarkably resilient in the face of all these new products. 
Right. Here, hearing you give that example, I'm thinking about like when people just kind of, you know, go back to flower as their kind of go-to method, at least those who have experience with the plant have a higher tolerance. Yeah. It's almost like, uh, I think of it as like vinyl, vinyl records, right? Like totally, or, or driving yeah. stick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, I mean, and, and in my own experience, you know, I've consumed edibles, I've consumed vapes, I've consumed flour, and there's nothing like smoking flour and that, that effect, that, that high, you know, it's, right. it's, it's right to the CB1 receptor in your brain. Um, you know, the, the edible takes a little more time to, to digest in your gut. It's more of a body high, but there's just something with the flower, man, that I just, that I just, you know, I don't think that I'll ever change in that regard. That's always going to be my go-to preference, you know? Yeah. And I think, I think you're, you know, I think you're not alone in that. Right. I think like, you know, despite, you know, a lot of cannabis companies will say in the earnings calls that, you know, we're the cannabis company for soccer moms or whatever. It's like <laughs> most cannabis really is being bought by regular users of cannabis. Like right. where majority, they're young men, you know, by and large, they're going to the store once a week or more. Um, and they're the ones who are really spending the most money on the product. And I think finally companies are waking up to that and figuring out how do we cater to our core consumers? Like, yes, we want to grow the market, but how do we cater to our core consumers? I mean, I don't want to, um, you know, I don't want to preempt any stories we're publishing, but um, I was talking to the CEO of one of the bigger MSOs and he said, you know, he basically reflected that. He was like, you know, low dose edibles, they're a great entry point, but oftentimes you see people buy those once and then they're just buying joints because they don't work well enough or they don't get them high enough. So yes, like if you are 55 years old and you're trying cannabis for the first time since college, the first thing you might buy would be a five milligram or 2.5 milligram, I don't know, coffee bean or, or, or cherry, you know, edible, like cherry gummy or whatever it may be. Um, but probably the next time you buy it, you're going to mix in a little weed, regular flour too with it. Um, right. That would be my guess. And I think that, uh, you know, as more market insights and market intelligence companies look at the industry closer, um, there are great startups like Headside, New Frontier Data. Um, that is being, that thesis is being borne out in the data. Um, and I think, you know, in a few more years when, you know, I don't know, Nielsen or, or the major consumer companies, um, you know, start building out cannabis related revenue streams, I think that uh, we will really see uh, that that flower is really important and really crucial for the industry. Yeah. And, you know, going back to your point about the, the vape gate crisis of 2019, it's almost and, and in a way, it's a good thing that that, you know, the government really kind of looked into the the low quality kind of snake oil products that were out there that were harmful, right? That to contain the vitamin E acetate and different things like that, the pesticides and mycotoxins. Yeah. Um, but I do get a sense that there is kind of a target on the vape markets kind of back in the sense that, and I don't, I haven't clarified this. I need to go back and check, but from what I've, I've had a guest on Aaron uh, Richard, a co-founder of WeedTube, And he was mentioning that in the latest um, relief act bill that was passed, I believe in December, the one that was like 5,000 page long, there yep. was one insert in there, like a, a little um, snippet about regulation around shipping vape, vape products within the country. Mm -hmm. and, I don't, I, you, you know this more than I, so why don't you tell everybody about what, what that was or what that means to the industry? <clears throat> yeah, basically they were, <laughs> so it's, it's a bit arcane, but basically they're going to prevent uh, vape companies from shipping their products to their, to their customers, like whether that's in state or across state lines um, and whether it's, you know, THC based or nicotine based. So it's vapes writ large. Um, and if they were to do so, they have to pay a heavy tax. And so a lot of vape, startups and a lot of vape companies have said this is going to kill our business right like this is unfair it's going to kill our business um you know they may be right right like they they're, they're giving they're given a really onerous uh what's the word i'm looking for really onerous rule to comply with basically that's going to really really harm their business um that being said you know it is Yes, it's somewhat unfair that uh, the government is cracking down on vape manufacturers, but it's not, um, it's not completely out of the blue, right? It was the illicit market that had vitamin E acetate and, and pesticides show up in their vapes. But to be fair, you know, those chemicals were also showing up in the legal market as well. We've reported on this. We've looked at studies like CBD vapes have had all sorts of pesticides, solvents, and heavy metals in them. Um, because you know they're difficult to regulate given state federal conflict, 
Um, so some of that is a little bit, I don't want to say self-inflicted, um, but some of it is due towards the general Wild West nature of the vape industry in general. Um, again, you know, I expect that to change. I expect these rules to be, you know, lessened the more regulators talk to the industry and figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, but for now, it's pretty onerous. And I think some companies are, are kind of struggling through dealing with that. Right. No, that was a perfect explanation. I was a bit confused about it and you clarified it for me. So, and I, and I do agree. I mean, it is the wild west right now, right? I mean, the entrance of bad actors in the space due to the state and federal conflict, like you mentioned, yeah. um, it's just kind of crazy right now. Right. Until we all come to a consensus at the federal level, I think that we'll start to see that stuff shake out. But for now, you just got to be wary of what you're buying. Make sure that you're, you know, the products that you're looking at have certificates of analysis, QR codes where you can actually see the potency levels right. and whatnot. And yeah. Um, the other, I mean, the, just to, just to kind of clarify sure. the, the vape issue, it's like the other, the other added layer is just that they have to sort of comply with any, <laughs> like all these different registrations and all these sort of like nitpicky tax codes and like whatever market they're, they're selling to. And that's just like, it's just added effort and effort in business is money. Um, so it's added time, added money, added effort that, that will just, you know, like I, I do feel for these companies that are trying to do it in the right way. I mean, this, that sucks. It's basically like right. the worst news they could have received. Like, oh, wow. Now we have this whole new thing to comply with. Um, not only is it seed to sale tracking and not only is it, you know, whatever our license is stated out, it's like this whole new, um, you know, I forget what the act's called, like prevent all, cigarette trafficking something like that but <laughs> no they have this whole new layer to, to comply with and it's just it's a headache right right exactly and that's kind of the day of the in the life right i mean every day it's kind of new new legislation new rules change new and and it's just the nature of the business right now um and that's why i just i have such an affinity for operators in the cannabis space because they are in my opinion some of the most resilient people out there i mean it's tough enough to just run your own business but to run a business in the cannabis industry is is a whole other level you know it, and it's 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 really hard i mean a lot of doing business is just being responsible and kind of projecting out to the future um and in cannabis that's basically harder than any other industry I can think of in recent memory. I mean, everything changes so, so quickly, um, you know, depending on who's in the White House, um, who's in, you know, the governor's mansion and whatever, you know, state you're in, uh, things do change really, really rapidly. And it's really hard to navigate and plan for these changes. Um, a lot of it is just being reactionary. And if you are an executive of a company, you know, you want to be proactive, not reactive. And so it's, it's a really difficult business to be in. Um, that being said, you know, U.S. cannabis companies, the MSOs are, have been pretty profitable in the last few quarters. They've been making a lot of money. So clearly it's lucrative, um, but it is difficult. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and no one would know better uh, than you about how fast paced and ever evolving the industry is um, because you're, you know, right, right at the forefront of, forefront of it, covering it. Um, so Jeremy, as we wrap up, I want to give you the floor, um, pull out your crystal ball, take off your reporter <laughs> hat if you want, or if you need sure. to. Um, but, but tell us like what, you know, how does this all play out, man? You're, you're on the front lines. What do you see this going in the coming years? Yeah. Do you want, do you want my guess? I like, want your guess. Like, yeah. I want, okay, I want so, what, what Jeremy Burke thinks. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I get this question asked a lot. Um, again, I want to give all the necessary reporting caveats. This is my <laughs> opinion. It's anecdotal. You know, I'm not basing this you know, on, on what sources are telling, or I am basing this on what sources are telling me, but it's not, it's not firsthand knowledge. Um, you know, I, I am skeptical that the U S will have federally legalized cannabis, uh, before the end of this legislative session. I, I, you know, I don't think that Schumer has the votes. I think he wants the votes. Um, but I think for him, it's a win-win introducing this bill because he can fend off, you know, a progressive challenge from the left in his primary, um, he can also use it as a cudgel to campaign for keeping the Senate and keeping the House uh, in, in 2022. So, you know, I do think there's a non-zero chance he gets it through, but I don't think it passes. What I do see happening is the continuation of state-by-state state cannabis. I think there may be a situation in which there is upwards of 30, 35 states that have legalized adult use or recreational cannabis, whatever word you want to put on it, before the federal government takes action. Um, there will be a tipping point there, and I don't know when it is, but, you know, I, I, I 
I don't see the federal government moving quickly on this. Um, that being said, you know, there are countries around the world that are moving a little bit quicker than the US. I think, you know, Mexico is moving very closely in that direction. There's been fits and starts there with actually rolling out recreational cannabis. Um, but it is de facto in some ways legal to consume there. Um, so soon the US will be sandwiched between two jurisdictions that have legal medical <laughs> cannabis, or sorry, legal medical and recreational cannabis. Right. Um, there are companies in Colombia that basically are developing to become, you know, export centers for the US. So if the federal government doesn't want US companies to get outcompeted by companies that can grow cannabis cheaper of a similar quality, then they're gonna have to make some changes. Um, so there is a, a bit of a protectionist element that I think will get the federal government moving. Um, and then beyond that, you know, I think Europe is also moving that direction. It's a little bit behind the curve, um, but at least on the medical front, you know, Portugal, Germany, um, you know, Greece, they're all sort of opening up their medical markets. And, you know, I think they're hoping that, you know, their weather is a little bit nicer for growing cannabis outdoors, a little bit cheaper. Um, they can export that cannabis into Canada and the U.S. eventually when these rules are rolled out. Um, you know, all in all, like, do I think that, you know, Biden will just with the stroke of a pen legalize marijuana? No, I don't even think he'll do that in the second term. Right. Um, but if, you know, if Schumer goes through that very narrow path he has to get this bill to his desk, like, yes, I do think Biden will sign it. And I do think we'll have legal, uh, legal marijuana that way. Um, but again, like, these are all sort of ideas. It totally remains to be seen. Um, and, you know, as you were alluding to earlier, things do change really, really quickly. And the calculus changes really, really quickly. You know, we could sit here like, you know, the filibuster is not, does not seem to be going anywhere, but if the filibuster is removed, all of a sudden that creates a very easy path for cannabis to get passed because um, you don't need 10 Republicans. So, you know, just to wrap that up, it remains to be seen. It's hard <laughs> to guess, but that, that's my best uh, attempt at it. <laughs> no, I, I think all of what you said is fair. I mean, um, it's it's very objective and it's not jumping to conclusion based off of emotion or what we want, right? Um, we see a lot of that online and this sense of urgency to get it done. And as we talked about earlier, it's complex, it's politicized. There's a yeah. lot of you know social, um, racially unjust components to it, social equity components that we all got to figure out, but at least the conversation has started and uh, we're starting to see a lot of momentum at the state level, you know, and, and as a retail investor within the MSO gang, it only allows these companies to grow. So anybody listening out there, cannabis investing, you know, I mean, um, yeah. it's a good time to do it. Right. <clears throat> I mean, just, just to harp on, on your point about social equity. I mean, at least w with the conversation, uh, around the black lives matter movements, uh, you know, George Floyd's murder at the hands of police. Um, it has put cannabis legalization into the forefront of the conversation. And this energy to me, it's persistent and it's not going anywhere. And cannabis is the one thing where I think progressives feel like they have the ability to win on these issues, right? Um, and there's a lot of momentum, um, particularly at the ground level, at the activist stage for doing that. And that is not going anywhere. And I think that will persist and that will be really strong. That being said, you know, those who are driving the bus, the Senator Chuck Schumer's of the world need to capitalize on that, right, right. on that momentum. Um, right. And that, that can be a challenge and they don't want to let it falter uh, because then they won't be able to get this done. That is such a strong point that you just made. I don't identify as a progressive Democrat, but I see the, I see the uh, value in, I mean, first, because it's true, because we talked about earlier of how people of color have been you know, unjustly treated and, and um, you know, disenfranchised, as we mentioned, but there is such a connection between racial discrimination and prohibition of cannabis. There's no doubt about it. And yeah. what I cannot wait to kind of see unfold is career politicians who have pledged that they're against systematic racism, but we'll really start to see who's on the side of ending systematic racism based on their stance when it comes to federal legalized cannabis. Absolutely. And I think, you know, when you, when you talk, like I, a big part of my job is talking to activists on this level, um, particular, you know, cannabis activists. And, you know, it, it really is one simple way where you can reduce interactions between the police and the public. Right. Um, so it is a really easy win and it is a really, 
beneficial win for them to get. And so that's why they're pushing so hard with it. And mm -hmm. notwithstanding all the other things we said, like, you know, 91% support for medical and recreational cannabis, it's like, okay, you know, let's put these issues together and we have a clear winner here. Again, the devil's in the details, it's complex. It's hard to put together, uh, but the momentum is persistent. It's strong. And, you know, it's my opinion that that's not going anywhere anytime soon. Yep. Hey, very well said, Jeremy, man, I could chop it up with you all day. This is fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, this is great. It's a good conversation. We can go for hours here. <laughs> I know, right? Well, um, we definitely need to do it again. Um, if you're open to it, I mean, like I guess, if obviously you're on the front lines. You're talking to all these different people and these players within the industry. So, you know, every maybe couple of months, if you want to come on and just kind of digress and talk about what's happening, um, I know that I would love it. And I know that the audience would get a lot out of it as well, man. Yeah, let's do it, Kevin. I, I really appreciate it. Appreciate it coming on. And uh, yeah, definitely looking forward to doing it again. I'll have, uh, you know, things will change 180 degrees in the next <laughs> three months and we'll have more interesting stuff to talk about. So Absolutely. yeah, man, looking forward to it. That sounds good. I appreciate that. Where can people find you on social media if they want to follow all the great stories and coverage that you're doing? Yeah, yeah. Week? Okay, I'll do a little plug. So follow me on Twitter at JF Burke. It's B-E-R-K-E, -E, not B-U-R-K-E. -E, so remember that. Um, and sign up for our newsletter. You know, we a lot of our writing happens behind the paywall, but our newsletter is free. It goes out every Friday. If you're interested in investing in the space, U.S. and Canadian companies um, will have all the information you need. If you're just interested in the policy changes, we'll have all the information you need there. A lot happens every week, so we have it all in one place. So please subscribe and uh, let me know what you think. Awesome. We'll be sure to include that um, that newsletter link within the YouTube description. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, so that'd be awesome. Cool. Well, thank you, Jeremy, for your time again. I look forward to running it back with you. And uh, thank you all for listening. This was fun. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. All right, bye. Bye.